And as a result, we're just going to keep going back and forth, back and forth. And it's just, it's so hard to understand, though. It's, I mean, it sounds pretty straightforward. One, two, three, four. Hey there. Welcome to The New Rules with Alan Pence, where we help you navigate today's chaos with precision. Your host, Alan Pence, has 25 years of experience working in business and government, and he knows how the old rules have fallen apart. Each episode, we'll explore how to thrive in this new landscape by mastering the new rules while everyone else is still figuring them out. Let's dive in. We are back. I have been liberated from my basement. I moved Thank from God. Texas all the way down to Bethesda. I was telling I was telling Tanya before we started that Justine Bateman, Mallory of Family Ties. You remember her? Has been mocking liberals online for their hot takes up to the election and kind of doing it from a director standpoint, like commenting mm-hmm. on their background and their lighting. So I figured like she got to me, she'd make fun of the keyboard and like the bed and the back. And I just couldn't have Mallory from Family Ties mock me. I would that would break me. No, I had to come to the office. You're evading Mallory. But <laughs> it's well, what what does that say, Alan? <laughs> I know, I know. It still haunts me. Most of my life was formed by watching 80s TVs. Oh, absolutely. And everybody who complains about like TikTok today, it's like, okay, was but was like getting excited about the double shot love boat fantasy island Friday or Saturday, whatever it was. Is that was that any better? Like was watching Magnum like better for me than TikTok? I don't know. So right. Or or Cosby. Thursday nights, Cosby, 8 p.m. Can't talk about Cosby. Can't talk about Cudston. <laughs> it's just forbidden now. Well, that's what it was. So how's San Cugat? Uh, is he going to survive in the election or the Spanish yeah. rioting in the streets? Or no, how they haven't quite, there hasn't been any rioting. But of course, you know, everybody here is like, how is it possible? No, no entiendo. How is it possible? You know, <laughs> <laughs> Europeans don't get it. I mean, I shouldn't say that. Many Europeans don't get it. Like, you know, the Hungarians get it. <laughs> That's right. The Hungarians are in pole position now, right? Right. They're, they're, they're on a light. You know, I mean, obviously not all Hungarians, but. By the way, reading the other day, Spain has the top growth rate of all the developed nations in the EU. So 2.8%. Germany is at like negative or something or like 0.5, 0.05 or something. Yeah, it's doing. It's Spain. Pretty, it's doing pretty well. I imagine that. Growth and sun. Something like 80 million tourists go there. Yeah, and it's. They had an article in the journal, but they also have like they're exporting. They're the second largest auto exporter mm-hmm. and a variety of other things. So good on Spain. Yeah. Makes you want to move here, doesn't it? I know. I know. It's not just subsidized lunches and naps. It right. sounds like there's other Free stuff going subsidized on. Subsidized naps. I love it. I right. love it. So I guess we're going to talk about the election today. Huh? Yeah, I think we probably should, right? Yeah, I think that's on everybody's mind. People are losing my neighborhood. People, so they were head. I think there were like uh, bits of people's heads after they exploded all over the ground in Bethesda. So right. it was well, that's uh, what you would expect where you are, right? Yeah, exactly. In the in the belly of the beast here, people are depressed. They don't know what to do. Well, what I wrote about last week is I, I try not to write about current events too much. You know, just like immediate hot takes on right. election and stuff like that. But I did think it was interesting looking at the take, you know, the, wh- how people explain the election. Mm. And for the most part, I think almost everybody's wrong. And there is a lot of talk about this being a realignment. I think Trump himself said that. And I just don't think it is. Like, I think I think in the day or two after, I kind of was like, oh, maybe this is. I mean, look, he just moved the entire, you know, huge chunks of the working and middle classes, a racially diverse coalition, winning a majority of Hispanic men moving, I think it was, 20% of black men, yeah, really we, younger. But let me ask you a quick question, though, Alan. Were people, yeah. you know, say in your neighborhood, were people really shocked? I mean, shocked like people yeah, were in 2016? A little, little different than that, I think, yeah, in a sense. But like, no one believed he was going to win. I, he didn't believe he was going to win in 2016. So right, I think right. it was more shocking than, yes. But they were completely shocked and devastated. Well, maybe they were more devastated than completely shocked. I think they'd been hit so many times with surprise wins, you know, that they are kind of a little bit more steeled to that. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, the real, the real evidence, you know, the case for it being a realignment and and it being a realignment, that means that you're going to 
shift to some kind of durable majority. You know, this is sort of like what FDR did Mm -hmm. in the 30s, where you had Congress essentially, you know, there were a little bit of back and forth, but, you know, it really moved to a Democratic led Congress. And then until, you know, until Reagan, that was really, or post Reagan, that was really the case. And then, you know, like some people say Reagan realigned. I think there's less of a case for that. Mm -hmm. We did, you know, jump back and forth. We always sort of have, but the evidence is clear that each the three branches of government or, or, or of the elected government have mm. gone back and forth on subsequent elections much faster than they did before. So like maybe in, you know, after FDR, the Democrats, you know, lost the house like once or twice over, you know, until, well, from the fifties on, from post Mm -hmm. Eisenhower on, they didn't until the nineties, but there was a lot less shifting back and forth, even though there were shifts. Right. So now we're seeing like every two years, there's like a shift, at least in one of the branches or one of the, make you dizzy. It does. Right. So what's happening here? And like, I, I think essentially, like, if you look at the macro view, What's mm-hmm. been happening since, I don't know, 2010 at the latest, I think, is that, or 2008, you know, with Obama's election, is that the, you know, the working slash middle class, depending on exactly how you define those, have seen, now, recently they've seen weight, real wage growth. But the reality is a lot of the services in our economy that are essential to middle-class life, I would say like education, healthcare, things like that, have, mm-hmm. or, you, you know, particularly if you're trying to get your kids through college or you're paying for your retirement and your healthcare, that you've seen these things go skyrocket, even as the price of goods, like TVs and computers and stuff like that, mm-hmm. have gone down, right? So there's that charge to put in that famously shows all these services going way up above the rate of inflation and all these goods going below. Yeah, what was it like 130? I mean, just to put it in perspective, like 130% healthcare services have gone up since 2000. I mean, 130%. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible, right? And even food, oh yeah, the other that I was trying to think of was childcare has gone up quite a bit and, More, and even housing, right? You know? Yeah, everything. Yeah, so it's all these things that you sort of need for that middle-class life are going up. And yes, it's offset by these other cell phones, and other things like that have gone down. Mm-hmm. But I think basically this group of people has been searching for someone to solve this problem since at least 2008, right? And mm-hmm. no one does it because each coalition has a fatal flaw in it. Which and, is? Well, so I would say if you're on the Republican side, there were a couple of fatal flaws pre-Trump which were, hey, I want to slash government support for Social Security and Medicare. Yeah. Which, that. when we're talking about medical services being a problem, you know, that is that is not popular, right? So that was the Paul Ryan wing, and that kind of Trump totally mm-hmm. jettisoned that, right? But there's still, you know, the Republicans still love a tax cut, right? And fundamentally, they're committed to continuing to cut corporate taxes. And I just don't understand this in the long term. I mean, first of all, how do you do more? Yeah. Like we'd already cut that one. It didn't result in that much growth. I mean, Mm -hmm. some, but it's net negative for the deficit versus growth. And like, you're just not going to get that much juice from the squeeze anymore. I mean, I think this is over. And if you're not going to deal with entitlements and military spending, which is really what the budget is, they, they can't resolve this. Right. So. There's no way we're going to be able to rejigger the numbers to make it work without raising corporate and taxes on what I would consider the upper middle class, right? People making right. two, three, four hundred thousand a year. So I, on the Republican side, they just can't like they, they can't figure out how to square that circle, right? And then on the Democratic side, theoretically, you'd think that they could raise taxes on corporations. Mm-hmm. But they've, they've become the party of the upper middle class and the professional class. So, you know, famously, they set this $400,000 limit on who gets a tax increase. Mm-hmm. And 
say that's the middle class, right? $400,000. Right. So we give me a break. And someone quipped, I think, that that's basically the salary of two married New York Times reporters. Like that's the limit for middle class because they're the right. ones that write the articles. So, you know, there's just no way they're going to be able to expand the tax. But, you know, corporate taxes, yes, have to go up. But when you look at the percentage of like how much revenue there is out there in tax, there's only so many corporate profits, right? You're going to have to go after mm -hmm. this upper middle class segment. And they don't want to do it because that's their constituency. So they can't pay for And they're not going to cut Medicare and Social Security either, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing about the Democrats is they've become, they've got this substantial as the professional class. They also won't resolve the trade, global trade imbalance. So until we're going to run these deficits, until we adjust the global trade balance so that China isn't, you know, dumping all these products on everybody. Right. So right. that forces you to either run a deficit in the public or private sector or have really high unemployment. And like, to be honest, the Democrats just aren't committed to resolving that problem. And so I just don't see, you know, until they get into a mode where they say, hey, look, we are going to have to kind of stick it to the professional class to get the working class back. Mm -hmm. I don't see it happening. I don't see them doing that. So to me, like what I put in the piece is a successful person who's going to win is going to really realign the electorate. It's going to be a Bernie Sanders circa 2016 who isn't, you know, dumps kind of the social stuff, you know, the transgender and the woke stuff, right? But, can't, mm -hmm. you know, but in 2016, he wasn't into that, right? Becomes a real class conscious person and is committed to changing the trade system and fixing the tax issue. And you just can't be like anti-American. You kind of be pro, pro American and patriotic. Like so, if you, patriotism is all plenty, right? Yes, so you got to have a patriotic Bernie from 2016. Yes, it's, it's okay, right? And I just don't see that coming on the Democratic side. And so then on the Republican side, theoretically, Trump has articulated a series of policies that would work with tariffs. You know, I favor other ways like capital controls, but just. Just for the sake of it, say like he's talking about rebalancing global trade. But I think they're, you know, again, they're the two problems. Like one is they're not going to raise the taxes on corporations and the well-off to balance out the fiscal issues. And then I don't think he's actually going to do a reordering of the global trade system. I tend to think. All he talks about is raising tariffs. Unless I've right. missed something. I mean, that which we know is is not the solution. Yeah, I mean, it could it could be partially part of the solution, but I think what he's really doing is he's threatening a lot of tariffs to try to push the Chinese and the U.S. companies to reshore mm -hmm. their manufacturing and production to the United States. Mm -hmm. So what he'll probably, I said in the article, like what he'll probably do is say, I'm going to put 60, 100% tariffs on you unless you build EV factories here. VYD in China has to build here. And, you know, that's essentially what Japan did to Alaska and Germany was they brought auto production to the Southeast, right? To have the, mm -hmm. at South Carolina and Georgia and stuff. And I just, I think the Chinese will cut a deal. I certainly think they'll do it, but they're just not going to follow through on much of it. So what we forget is that. You can't trust them. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the first trade deal, right? They were supposed to buy all this stuff and do all these things. And they did like, a third of it, you know, they just didn't follow through. That was a pretty minor deal. You know, you're talking about a country like I've written about before, a Marxist country that looks at production and taking advantage, you know, taking the lead in all advanced manufacturing technologies as a way to assert its global power and control. Mm -hmm. It's not going to transfer the massive amount of its physical plant technology into the United States. That's just right. not going to happen. So mm -hmm. I think you'll see a couple of BYD factories get built somewhere and Trump will cut a couple of ribbons. But I think and he's, I don't sense that he's fully committed mm -hmm. to reordering the trade system and going through the pain that that requires. So I just don't see a resolver. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think both, neither party is willing to do the things that they need to to capture that metal. And so as a result, I look at you know, when I looked at the election, it does, you know, it is a decisive win, clearly winning all three. It, it, I mean, it was. We haven't called the House yet, but it will, they'll, it'll probably go Republican. 
But I mean, mm-hmm. by one or two votes, I mean, mm-hmm. it's the thinnest majority like ever. And, you know, I think what we saw is once you take a step back and you look at every single democracy in the Asia and the West, and it seems like Latin America, every single incumbent party lost an election this year. Mm-hmm. So like Fran- uh, Macron lost his majority in the French parliament, but he did snap elections. The LDP party in Japan lost their majority. They have a caretaker or prime minister right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you look at the UK, it didn't matter. The conservatives were in power there and labor came in. Modi, almost, mm-hmm. I, I mean, he's still there, but like he lost significant ground in the parliament. So this isn't like all over the world. And it went right, left, left, right, depending on who was in power. Sure. It didn't matter. And look, Germany, like, I mean, Schultz's coalition is falling apart and it's pretty clear they're all getting voted out, right? And the CDU is going to come back. So I look at that and I'm like, this whole election was just about the macro economy and how, uh, how there was inflation mm-hmm. for, you know, three or four years. People are pissed about it. They're still pissed about it. And there was a lot of inflation in those services that we talked about. Yeah. You know, I can't imagine how much childcare prices went up, you know, and food and housing and everything. So in reality, I think that happened everywhere in the world. And I know like, you know, and and we have to come up with reasons why things happen, right? And we have to blame the Biden administration for causing inflation. And, you know, look, to some extent, maybe that's true. But if you look at the chart of what happened in every country, in every part of the world. Yeah, it wasn't just here in the U.S., of course. No, everybody got inflation at the exact same time. Mm-hmm. And it all went up almost to the same level. We weren't, you know, we were bad, but kind of on par with everyone else. And then it all came back down at the same time. So, yeah, I mean, maybe you attribute that to everybody spent, right, at the same time. Right. like the, But no one spent like the U.S., right? And nobody knows how to spend like us. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, but you had significant inflation in Europe too, and they didn't spend that much money. So I just think there was like a supply shock. Well, most supply chains were in trouble and things went up and down and maybe, you know, the, the profligate spending here exacerbated that a bit. Mm-hmm. But it was the same story everywhere else. And now it's coming down. And I just don't think you can, attribute what happened to like this country, the, to the circumstances of this country alone. I think once you look across the world, you're like, oh yeah, Democrats had no chance. Like it was never going to work. Mm-hmm. And like, and then looking at the, the Republican coalition, I'm like, they're, they, you know, there's this fatal flaw in there where they're about to go cut taxes for corporations again, which is not going to be popular. And so they're going to hit, they're going to do something, you know, they're either going to slash government spending a lot which will cause a recession because if we don't run deficits, we're going to have, we have the same trade policy problem mm-hmm. or they're going to blow a hole in the deficit and not pay for a bunch of tax cuts and, you know, rates will go up and, you know, so we'll either have a lot, we'll either have inflation again or a recession or both. And like by 2026 or 2028, people are just going to shift back to the Democrats. And so I see the same group in the middle looking for the answer and it's not going to come and they're just going to keep shifting back and forth. So to me, this is not a realignment. It's a rejection of what happened across the world during the pandemic. Mm. And I'm not, you know, maybe, you know, I also say Kamala Harris was a terrible candidate. If they had gotten somebody that came out of competitive primaries, I think maybe the margin of loss would have gone down a bit. Maybe they would have kept the house. Do you think that she, so you think she was a terrible candidate. Was it just that, or was it also, you know, the process that the Democrats put her through? You know, you got three months, you can go through the primaries. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think she never would have gone through. She never would have won the primary. Yeah, so, mm-hmm. yeah. so she was just a bad candidate. And like, if they had had someone incredibly talented, but the only way they get those people is through the primary process. So, mm-hmm. like, you know, I think the same thing kind of like Hillary got anointed as well in 2016, and she was a bad candidate. So, like, 
I would suggest to the Democrats to allow, you know, they they send it off and Bernie Sanders in 2016 and used a lot of party power to do it. Yeah. I think it was a total mistake, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I think Bernie probably would have beaten Trump in 16. Hmm. So I think, you know, like, hey, look, if they run competitive primaries, I don't see anybody out there on the Democratic horizon, which the party is going to be like, we're getting this person in, right? You know, they're going to let it be competitive. In 28, I think they stand a really good chance to win. And I think one of these problems in the Republican policy agenda is going to pop up. You know, they're, these goals can't all work together and they'll be fun. So like, I, I just think we're going to keep shifting back and forth. And, and to be honest, a lot of the things that are going to happen are probably just macro things that, yes, I do believe that candidates and policies make slight differences Mm -hmm. to like how much you win by, where exactly. Like, would Josh Shapiro have won three? Instead of losing all seven swing states, would he have won three? Sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe. But that wouldn't change the outcome. And maybe you would have kept the house with a more popular candidate. Maybe. But these are like a bunch of races in what, California that I don't know how much influence Josh Shapiro would have had on that. And uh, I don't know. I just think like we have, I think we have this illusion of control and certainty about like, oh, this happened for this reason. It's sort of like, I don't think either the politicians are just awash in a big macro field of things happening that they have very little control over and they can like tweak some things around the edges. And I think most of us should be pretty cautious about saying, Oh, the electorate's real. Uh, and now we're going to do this forever. And it's like, I, I think we have like zero evidence that that's going to happen. It, it didn't surprise you at all how much he won by. I, you I know, mean, I mean, among young women voters, like, I mean, that surprised me. It did. Yeah. I mean, I, it surprised me, no doubt. But I bet if you, do, and I haven't gone in and looked at like who's voted for him in these other countries. Yeah. I bet you see a lot of surprising shifts in those countries too. Yeah. People hate inflation. They hated it, right? And they, they, yeah, I think they no. were just like, screw these guys. We're going to get somebody else. And so I think, yeah, like it was surprising how much they reacted, but I think that was. I mean, when you consider a female candidate, you know, the abortion issue, I mean, there's so many other issues too, but I mean, that did surprise me. Anyway. Yeah, the abortion issue. I mean, I think Trump did an amazing job backpedaling and get, getting away from that. Yeah, he right? was talented in doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think he took that issue off the table pretty quick. And like, as much as Democrats wanted to keep hammering it, I said, I just don't think, again, I think that most of these things are not going to be resolved on these issues. Mm-hmm. Right. I don't. Mm-hmm. The exception would be, I mean, if the Republican, I think if you're a Democrat, you want the Republicans to pass a national abortion ban because they would get slaughtered in the next election. That would be the only, I mean, they would just be wiped out. But uh, so that's never going to happen. We'll never say never, but I think it's very unlikely. Never say never. But yeah, I don't think elections going forward are going to be waged on that issue. I think Trump has definitively moved it to the back burner. And like you'll have maybe Alabama will, or Georgia will swing on it state one mm-hmm. and state level. But I think Trump successfully took that issue off the table. Mm-hmm. And so if I'm a Democrat, I'm like, hey, I'm going to move on to something else, <laughs> you know? And and to me, go in and be like, next time there's an any economic downturn, and you're like, Trump is cutting taxes for wealthy corporations who are running their their income through Irish subsidiaries to avoid U.S. Ta- I mean, come on, that is an awesome issue. And like, right. they're going to get killed on that, right? I mean, when you got like Pfizer paying, you know, 5% tax rate, I think people are going to be pissed. And but none of this is new. And the Democrats still, th- this is not new. A- and they don't seem to know how to get it together. I mean, what do you say, Alan, to all those forlorn Democrat voters? Nothing you could have done would have made any difference, made, made much of a difference, maybe around the margins. But like, to be honest, if you just had the bad luck of being, and like, look, if they go the other way, if Republicans go the other way and, and implement austerity, we saw the result of that in 2010 and 2016. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now you had a super talented Obama who was able to win in 2012. I think that is probably a credit to his level of talent as yeah. a politician. But the reality is voters didn't like austerity either. They hate inflation. They hate austerity. Mm-hmm. And if you, if you adopt one or the other, you're going to lose. 
Mm-hmm. And like, and in the inflation standpoint with, you know, like what happened in 21, 2022, I'm not so sure there is any way to avoid it. Mm-hmm. I think that we have to accept the fact that the world is a complicated place. And I don't think the most talented politician in the world with the best economists could have stopped inflation. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe you could say they would have made it slightly better. I don't know. Okay, so Harris wins two swing states instead of zero. All right, but it didn't change anything. Mm-hmm. I, I just, I think I'm getting to be more like Tolstoy in my old age, where I just think there are these forces and they're complicated and they happen. And there's probably not much we can do about. Well, and many people don't understand those forces too. <laughs> right, but I mean, people are pissed. They're like, hey, my childcare and housing and college and and medical services all cost way more than they did before my car everything i'm pissed You're and i got right, it. Go should to another tv it's like they've got three huge tvs right yeah well they don't they, 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 they take they book the tv and then look at what's going up right so i think that they're just pissed and they're angry and and if you're an incumbent you're screwed that's mm-hmm. it like i think all the rest of it is just like you're talking about small you know basis points of difference i mm-hmm. so if i was a democrat i would just say don't be so despondent like i would love it if the democrats really looked at themselves and were like hey look we're going to become more class-based we're going to get rid of this woke stuff and you know trying to separate everyone based on you know oppression and color and gender yeah, you talked about that. Thing. Thing. Yeah, which I think is where it's that. I mean, those are important issues. But what you're saying is that they, the Democrats, have become. No, I don't even think they have to. What? I don't even think they have to. I mean, I wish they would. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, I mean, I think immigration was important, but I think that it was a distinctly secondary issue to the inflation in the economy. When people say the economy and they mean inflation. Yeah. That's very clear. So when I think there was a couple of polls when they asked people why they think the economy is bad, they say inflation or prices. So, you know, and I think I think immigration is one of those issues that goes up and down. People, it's more or less popular based on what's happening. Mm. I really don't think it was a deciding issue. I, I tend to really disagree with people on that. I think if we hadn't had inflation and the economy was really strong, no, it would have been something people were mad about, but I don't think it would have made the difference. Mm, and, it's a major um, issue for my mom living in Maine. Yeah, but I think like it goes up and down. On, and like what I point out in the article is like, don't forget when Trump was going crazy on immigration in his first term, by 2018, immigration was what I mean, people were for more immigration. They were so it became popular again. Now, I think we're on unfettered illegal immigration is crazy right come on let's be sensible let's forget here. though i mean i think that changed too from 2016 to 2018 also came on the heels of him separating you know kids and i mean that right so if he goes way right and does a bunch of that stuff again that'll be all over the news and you now immigration will get more popular again so yeah unfortunately i don't think the democrats have to change all that much they just you know like what i would say is i would you know, just moderate on immigration, be like, yes, we need a secure border, but we favor more legal immigration mm-hmm. from all parts of the world. You know, I think that would be acceptable. That's not going to get you killed. Mm-hmm. And like, just wait for the economy to change. And you know what? Right. Now, I have my theory of what would shift the electorate permanently that I Again, explain why I don't think Democrats are going to be able to do or Republicans. And maybe I'm wrong too. You know, there is a possibility that. Say it like, again. So, again, yeah. I think the middle is about rewinding, excuse me, realigning the trade system. So we all have these mm-hmm. persistent trade deficits. So you can do that in a variety of ways with tariffs, currency controls, industrial policy. And so, like, if we could shift these, I think what's happening, I, to be honest, some of this being driven worldwide. Is like every, you know, China overproducing, Germany overproducing, and all these, and then even countries like Japan and South Korea have disproportionate manufacturing shares of their GDP. Mm -hmm. It's like all these countries that are overproducing are destroying demand within their own countries Mm -hmm. and increasingly within the countries they export to. Because in the end, the purpose, you know, like Keynesian would say, the purpose of exporting goods 
is to get money to buy imports. Three. That's Purpose how it should work. exporting is to import. Right. Is to buy imports from other people and you export what you're really good at and import what other people are really good at. If you refuse to import from anybody, then mm-hmm. eventually the, the people you export to, if they don't change their policies, run out of money to pay for your exports. So everybody's starting to get poorer. And I think that's what's happening across the world is we're destroying demand globally by allowing China to run this crazy policy where they're running a policy that like Singapore runs when they're the second largest economy in the world. I mean, it's just not sustainable. Really? And Germany's kind of, you're seeing what's happening. And look, Japan, China is suffering. I mean, there's no growth in China. <laughs> they're deflating. I mean, look at Germany. They're growing at 0.05%. So like, we have got to structurally realign this global trading system. And it's going to be painful for elites in those countries and for us. Wall Street will be there there is there'll be less money flowing into Wall Street. So asset prices are going to deflate. And in Germany, you're going to have to restructure to more. You're going to have to spend more. You're going to have to have more fiscal looseness. And you're going to have to stop relying on exporting and shift to more services based economy. Same in China. I just don't think these guys are going to do it. Or mm-hmm. gonna, eventually they'll be forced to. So I think we're seeing, a, we'll probably see some kind of global deflation over the long term if we can't shift this. But in the short term, I think we're going to see a lot more inflation because we're going to start fighting about it. And I mean, supply shocks. Yeah. And that is not what people want to hear. <laughs> no, it is not. But I think that, that basically the only choice is to reorder the system and then the way you contain the inflation that's going to result temporarily from the shift, right? It takes a while to start reordering who's best at what, manufacturing what, and getting people from manufacturing the services and services of manufacturing based on the country, right? That's going to take a decade or two. Sure. But that's what we have to go through. We're sort of starting to go through it. And then I think, you know, you've got to make sure that the middle and working classes are shored up so they have their healthcare, they have their education, they have their retirement, social security. You're going to have to tax the corporate sector and broaden the base beyond just the super wealthy down to the affluent. So that's, you know, below 400,000 to pay for all that stuff. Yeah, you need to expand that tax base. Yeah. So I see that that's the winning formula. We reorder the global trading system to bring more manufacturing back here, but also other places. UK, mm-hmm. you know, Australia, Canada. And then you've got to also tax these sectors like the corporate and affluent to pay for the middle class. So that's the winning formula to me that gets us to the right place where we get back to a more balanced economy. And I just don't think either party is willing to throw the part of their coalition that it needs, they need to, to get there over the side of the boat. And as a result, we're just going to keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it's just, it's, it's so hard to understand, though. It's, I mean, it sounds pretty straightforward. Tax the rich, tax the corporations so that we can all have affordable health care, child care, et cetera. Right. All those things that a middle class democratic society should have. Why? I don't see. I mean, I agree with you. I don't see it happening. No. Yeah. Because each one has, you know, I mean, look. Who's, who's going to be running the Treasury Department? It's going to be some guy from Wall Street. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think, I, think, I think Trump is more of a conventional Republican than people think. And I think his second term, he will probably rule much more like a conventional Republican. So I think they're going to try, you know, they're, already t- they're on the Hill talking about um, overturning Obamacare, or getting rid of food stamps. You know, it's just like... I heard that stuff in the 90s, right? With Newt Gingrich. So now nah, who knows what's going to happen. In the we United heard States. that stuff from the GOP. Yeah. So like how different is Trump? Right. I don't know. We'll see. I tend to think he's probably tapping a little bit more regular Republican than he used to be. Hmm. So, so maybe everybody got the Ron DeSantis they wanted in a different package. <laughs> but we'll see. You know, I do think, you know, like I'll give Trump credit. He identified some real issues. I just don't know whether he's willing I also think he's the kind of guy, he looks at the Dow or the S&P and, and thinks that's his report card. And mm. these reforms are going to require those asset prices to deflate, which means go down, right? Mm-hmm. So we can't have, you know, the market at 
24, 25 times earnings. It's got to go back down to 15 times. And that mm. means the price goes down. And that means rich people are pissed. Yeah. And I just don't see that happening in a Trump presidency. So, you know, I just don't think he'll pay the prices to get those things done. And neither will the Democrats. So we'll just keep going around and around. Uh, it's a little... And because. It's a, it's a depressing message in one sense that, like, real problems won't... I mean, some problems will get solved, right? But not the fundamental ones. No, the fundamental ones. But it's re reassuring in the sense of, like, I just don't see massive changes, I think. You know, we're tweaking around the edges of the same kind of policies, and they'll shift back and forth, right? To all those people out there that say that, you know, it's Armageddon, end of the world, you're basically saying, you know, it's not that bad. You're like a bomb. You're a salve right now, Alan. <laughs> I don't know if I'm a salve. I just think, like, I also think, like, stop thinking that you can change it that much. Yeah. It just is what, I mean, you're, they're going to do all these diagnoses and all this stuff, and everyone's going to put in what they want their thing to be going forward. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it would be helpful if you got somebody who can, like, mix it up on Joe Rogan for three hours. Yes, I think <laughs> moderating on immigration helps. Yes, I think not talking about trans issues that much. Those are going to help. But I don't think they're definitive. I just mm -hmm. don't, I, I think that that's what people are going to say. And, you know, a couple other things about, oh, we've got to have a, a more liberal policy or a more progressive policy versus a more centrist policy. I just don't think any of those things are actually going to make the difference, particularly because they're actually not going to they're not going to mm -hmm. do Bernie, uh, patriotic Bernie Sanders circa 2016. That's not mm -hmm. So, you know, I just think it'll keep going on like it's been going on and you'll have another night of victory and the Republicans will be navel gazing about how they went so crazy or did this thing wrong. And, you know, I just don't think any of it will matter that much. Yeah. What do you think about foreign policy, though? You wrote about Ukraine, too, a couple of yeah. weeks ago, a week ago. Yeah, well, I think we're going to... Actually, I'm much more hopeful on Ukraine now than I would have been. So I do think that's one place where Trump really will make a big difference. And in my view, a, a positive one. So, you know, my... And I know people are going to hate that. And, you know, look, I think that one of my major themes is that people have to wake up from this delusional world where the U.S. was the preeminent power to do whatever it wanted and didn't, need, didn't face any consequences for what it did. Mm -hmm. And we need to wake up. We're starting to wake up a little bit here. I don't think Germany is waking up yet, but it will soon. And part of waking up is realizing that we can't do everything everywhere all the time. And I don't know how many people have, when I say that Ukraine is not very important in the United States, have told me, oh, but we learned in the 20th century that we can't ignore things in Europe. And I'm like, guys, this is not the 20th century, okay? China was a preeminent economy in the world for centuries before that, right? So, I mean, over-indexing all your learnings from one 50-year period does not seem intelligent to me. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, like, Europe's still somewhat important, but there is no power in Europe that can dominate the continent. I mean, these people saying that Putin's going to, like, roll over Poland and all these other countries, I mean, the guy hasn't secured the Donbass, okay? Like, let's mm -hmm. get realistic here. He is not capable of taking all this territory. He can't even take Ukraine, for God's sakes. He can't occupy it, right? I mean, he knows this, and I just don't get it. He yeah. hasn't been able to get the aid that Ukraine has been getting. But if that was a way, because they are not of strategic interest... I think he can wreck Ukraine. He can't occupy it. He'd need hundreds of thousands of soldiers that he does not have to occupy a hostile country, especially in the West. I don't think he has any delusion that that's going to happen. And he's certainly not going to be able to go past that. Mm. I mean, come on. Like, these countries on the border. I mean, look what he did in Georgia, right? We said, oh, we're going to put Georgia in NATO. He invaded. He, he like, worked in these two pro-Russia regions right by the border. And yeah. they wrecked Georgia. And then those two separatist regions kind of aligned with Russia. And then he left. That's exactly what he's trying to do in Ukraine. He's like, right. if you're going to try to put it in NATO, I'm going to ruin it. And I'm going to, you know, seize a couple of territories by the Russian border. 
where I'm probably more popular. But in reality, he's not going to take the whole country. So I think we knew, and look, if he was ever going to lose in Ukraine, they consider that an existential issue. They will go nuclear. There is no doubt in my mind. Mm. Now, maybe they're just going to use nukes in the Ukraine, but like they're going to keep escalating. And Obama knew this, right? Obama said, whatever it was, 2014. Yeah, you wrote about 10 years that, ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, he said, Russia, Russia has escalation dominance in Ukraine. They care about it more than we do. Mm-hmm. He's 100% right. He's still right. They will keep doing what they have to do to win. And if they lose, it's even more dangerous. So what are we doing? We are not willing to actually go to the mat for this country. We are never going to put troops on. That would be crazy. And it's just not that important to us. So I think all we're doing is getting a bunch of Ukrainians killed. You know, as Sean Mearsheimer says, we're, we, we led them down the primrose path. Mm-hmm. And I think Trump will probably come in and do something where he threatens to rearm Ukraine and all this stuff, but in, in order to cut a deal where Russia basically keeps what it's got and Ukraine stays out of NATO for some mm. period of time or ever. And then, you know, to be honest, like I, I heard a commentator the other day, I really agreed with like, hey, if the EU wants to go in and rebuild new Ukraine, just get a ceasefire. Like, you know, it's going to be a bitter ceasefire. It's not going to be some like, great peace or anything but go like develop the country and then 20 years from now when putin's dead but you're like way richer than these other provinces they'll probably come back because they're sick of it right you know mm-hmm. i mean i think that we had no strategy to win in ukraine and i hate to admit it but sergey lavrov the russian foreign minister said it right he's like the united states will fight to the last ukraine right mm-hmm. and no far of it that Mm-hmm. And I think that that's a sad state of affairs. Look, I am sympathetic to the Ukrainian people. It sucks. Yeah, no, of course. Right? We've got to get over this delusion that we can right all wrongs in the world. We cannot. We are constrained. And spending all this blood and treasure in, in, in equipment in Ukraine gets us nothing. Mm-hmm. And our real enemy is in China. And all we've done is push Russia into China's arms. That's all we've done for us. Mm-hmm. So stupid. And we've got to, you know, I'm hopeful that Trump will appoint, there's a guy, Elbridge Colby, who's been a clear thinker on this, seeing the China threat over Ukraine. Not that he's not sympathetic to Ukraine. It's just like, we don't have the capacity to take care of all these problems, right? So we got to focus on our interests. Our interest is containing China. And so I'm hopeful the administration will really start focusing on that and get us out of this, you know, waste of resources. Well, and raising false hopes, right? I mean, that's essentially what you're saying, too. There's been a lot of raising false hopes. Yeah. And pretending like Russia is important. It is not all that important. I mean, it is a nuclear power. Yes. We have to be careful. To be honest, we should be working with them to fight the Chinese, to contain the Chinese, because... I mean, the only thing longer than the Russian-Chinese border is their history of hostility toward each other. So this detente and alliance is a temporary thing that I think we can split. I mean, clearly, really? Kissinger did that on the Chinese side. I think we could do it again. Now, we've lost probably a decade or two on that from being stupid about Ukraine, but I think we can get back there. And, you know, look, I just think that people are delusional They're being fed by these, you know, think tank communities who get money from weapons companies in D.C. I know them. We actually sublet our old office to one side. Yeah. I'm 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 on the take, too. So we're all on the take, Alan. We're all on the take. That's right. So but they're they're driving this narrative because they think we, you know, I look, I don't want to cast total aspersions. It's not just because they're getting funded by by defense contractors, but they have this belief that the U.S. is this mythic country that somehow has within its capability total spanning world control. And like they're living this delusion that existed in 1995. It is no longer the case. Mm -hmm. And we look, if the Chinese can build a better electric vehicle, which they have, 
and with BYD, why can't they build a better tank, plane, ship, missile, or anything else? Can't they? Of course. <laughs> they're not there yet, but they will. So stop thinking that we have remit across the world and we have infinite resources that can be sent anywhere to do anything. We have to wake up and start making choices. And some of those choices are unpleasant. And it is unpleasant for the people of Ukraine. And I feel for them. But it is not the U.S.'s mission to save that country. We got to do what we can now to get a semblance of that country back on its feet. But we are not liberating the rest of Ukraine. It is not happening. So stop. Mm -hmm. You're just getting people killed. You know, I just wish Niall Ferguson and these other people would get a clue. They're just, I think that they're completely delusional. Yeah. So, you know, at least with Trump in office, you're going to get rid of the delusion that we're going to do this. I mean, thank God Mike Pompeo is not coming in or Nikki Haley. Those, these guys are as bad as it gets. But I think on Ukraine, we'll get positive progress. I think with China, if they bring in Elbridge Coley, I think that's a really good sign. But look, you know, I mean, Trump had multiple neocons running foreign policy last time. It, Mike Pompeo and Nikki Haley, these people hadn't found a war that they didn't want to get involved in. And they mm -hmm. were all over the administration. So, you know, like Trump is, for everyone saying how crazy he is, he's pretty ecumenical. And people get, you got John Bolton running around. I mean, God, like this is not, this is not an isolationist or a John Bolton, yeah. A realist all the time. I mean, these, these guys are crazy neocons. So, I think that there are some refreshing signs right now, but I mean, I would be cautious on that. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think that Trump believes much of anything that isn't overcome by somebody who's good on, who's good at sparring with people on Fox. So they are in the administration, no matter what they believe. So I do think that like, we're going to get a good deal here. Well, not a good deal, but we're going to get the deal that stops the killing and stops the erosion of our focus on China. So it might be too late, um, to be honest, but hopefully we will put all our efforts into to continue to contain China because, you know, it's getting dangerous. And if, we don't, and if we don't take care of this manufacturing issue, you know, again, I go back to if they can make, the BYD can make a better EV, I'm not really sure what they can make better than us right. over time. We better wake up. Wake up. Yeah. I got to say, you know, I don't know how you did it, Alan, but you actually, I, I'm feeling more hopeful after this <laughs> podcast about the election results than before. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just think that, look, that we have an entire election industry that's supposed to make you feel like this choice is the only thing that matters and is so determinative of everything that will happen. And I think my this is part of my message of the new rules is like, things are shifting because they're shifting for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And these elections and the politicians, they are simply on the, they're riding the wave of these shifts. And there's only so much freedom of choice that they have. Yeah. And so I think, Resist the urge to think that everything's so determinative all the time. Like most things are going to happen because they're going to happen. And like, we, I think we would be, be much better off, like kind of pumping the brakes and saying like, all right, well, 95% of what happens in Trump's term is going to be because it would be the exact same thing that what Kamala would do. Mm -hmm. So I firmly believe that maybe it's 90% who knows, but most of the stuff is just going to happen because it's going to happen. So, you know, I think there are a few hey. places that's different, but in a weird way, it's comforting. It is, yeah. The world is the world is a far more complex than our place than our tiny minds can understand. But absolutely. Well, maybe we should end there after I start dropping f bombs about China and Ukraine. So, <laughs> make me mad. Make me mad. Those neocons, man, make me mad. I know, I know. You get fired. I know, up. I probably make, the neocons get you fired me. up. I know. I'm, I'm sure the feeling is mutual. So if they listen to me at all, so mutual destruction. Yeah, well, we'll see what Justine says about my new setup here. So I think I might start following her on Instagram. Yeah, she's on X. I don't know if she's on Instagram, but oh, check she? it out. Okay, I'm not on the grams. So 
Yeah, I'm not really either. But like recently, I thought, you know, maybe I should be. I mean, especially when you say somebody like, you know, Justine Bateman. An important figure like Justine Bateman is on. I agree. <laughs> I agree. I just right. wonder if what we're uh, Jason Bateman books. He's, I think he's pretty died in the wall uh, progressive. So it must be yeah. an interesting Thanksgiving conversation. I bet. Do they talk though? I don't know. Maybe they don't even have a relationship. So, what we so? No, you know, we do it. But I'm not privy to the Bateman family. Uh, yeah, just a disclaimer. A disclaimer, <laughs> yes. I, I'm not knowledgeable. Maybe there's something on Reddit that can explain it for us. So. Perfect. Excellent. All right. Well, enjoy your evening and lovely San Kuga in the right, 28% GDP economy. Yeah, right. right. Just lit in the light here, like literally, and, you know, in all the ways. Not just the free wine, but the GDP, too. <laughs> Get put more of that GDP. I love it. <laughs> all right. All right. See you next week. All right. Bye. Talk to you later. Bye. You've been listening to The New Rules with Alan Pence. For more insights on mastering the new game, follow at A Pence. That's A-P-E-N-T-Z on X and make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks for tuning in. And remember, in today's world, you don't follow the rules, you write them.